my name is Anya Sperrin. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Centre for Disability Law and Policy down at NUI Galway. And my primary role is with the Real Productive Justice Project at NUI Galway. Um, so I look at the legal and policy uh, kind of framework surrounding reproductive justice for disabled people in Ireland. And I do interviews with legal, medical and social work professionals who work in the area of reproductive justice. Um, so I can talk a wee bit later more about the, the project overall, um, but I'm one of a, a four-woman team. Our principal investigator is Professor Ellen Erflin, who's the head of the centre. Um, my colleague, um, Dr Jenny Dagg, is another postdoctoral researcher. She collects oral histories from disabled people themselves about their lived experiences. And then we've got our uh, research assistant, um, Maureen Fajarda. And we're funded by the Welcome Trust in the UK. So that's a, a brief synopsis of the project. So I think, again, it was um, Professor Eleanor Flynn who kind of spearheaded the project and put the proposal together for the funding. Um, but it was really around the time of kind of discussions in Ireland around reproductive justice in general were taking place. And there was a real gap. Um, in how kind of abortion and reproductive rights relates to disabled people. Their voices weren't being included on, on either side of the um, the discussion and where you know the, the issue of disability was being sort of used and abused by both sides as well. And um, so this absence of well-informed um, kind of based on real life experiences, reproductive experiences was really missing. So that's really what the project aims to address now. We, we are collecting stories from disabled people themselves about their lived experiences of everything from fertility and contraception, pregnancy and birth, parenting and abortion. And our understanding of disability is extremely broad as well. We're mostly informed by the, the social model of disability. So we recognise that you know, impairments are at an individual level, but society um, creates barriers to full inclusion. It's society that creates disability. So using that approach then, we've been welcoming stories and have collected about 40 stories from people with physical, intellectual, mental health and psychosocial disabilities, um, from people who are deaf, people on the autism spectrum, um, people with long-term and chronic illnesses, um, so we really, we aren't limited, we don't have a, a set sort of tick boxes of who we want to hear from, it's all about the person identifying themselves. Um, so we've been gathering their stories as well as experiences from professionals, so legal, medical and social work professionals who work to provide services to disabled people about what that experience has been, what are their challenges, um, you know, what have they found that we need more of or less of in some cases where there's negative practices um, and we've also been making sure to, to bring the two groups together and um, so we've been holding discussion for over the last year or so on each of our thematic areas so one on pregnancy and birth one on um, fertility and contraception one on parenting and one on abortion so we have had closed events We've invited specific people to, um, to speak a mixture of people with lived experiences and professionals and um, just to hear each other's perspectives and um, mostly for professionals to hear how, you know, when they go about their day to day work, the impact that that can have um, on people receiving those services, what they can learn, how they can improve. Um, and it's not to be overly defensive about their own work, just to see, you know, the impact and a lot of the times we've heard very powerful stories about negative impacts or uh, we've had really good collaborations come out of the discussion for as well where professionals have invited some of the, the lived experience participants to come to their place of work to do a walk around a medical setting and just to point out what would be and isn't accessible um, and there's been real like on a micro level there's been some very positive direct engagement and we're hoping as the project goes on to have more kind of systemic engagement across the way. So ableism has been the biggest issue that's come across all of our topics and I know that this is kind of more focused on healthcare so I'm keeping in my mind more the fertility, the pregnancy um, and the abortion kind of stories and the work that we've done rather than the parenting.
but yeah I think ableism and people who've come and told us their stories obviously if you go from being pregnant all the way through to having a child to becoming a parent you might touch on all of our topics or only one or two of them um, but we've been welcoming stories whatever many amount of topics it's been touched on and um, so ableism has come out across and it can be kind of structural um, or kind of physical in terms of somebody attending a, a a service, a GP, a hospital, um, and not being able to get in the front door or turning up and the ramp not working or the lift not working. Or it can be much more, um, I suppose, difficult maybe to address than putting in a ramp um, would be kind of attitudes. Um, so we've had stories of people just because they have a disability, assumptions being made, well, why would you want to become a parent? Or people, um, especially assisting, um, seeking assisted human reproduction um, that service providers might think well I've got an obligation to a future potential child um, and if that child is there if there's a risk of them being born with a disability then we don't want to continue and um, so these sorts of very much ableist discriminatory attitudes that just seem to be um, kind of off the cuff comments sometimes that can be really difficult and really harmful to the person who's trying very hard to become a parent or is in the process, you know, is um, in, in the, the throes of pregnancy and, and looking down the barrel of engaging with maternity services. Um, yeah, there's been some other stories that, you know, where people who have had a disability have gone through and become parents um, on their second and third children, just won't engage until they really have to very late on in their pregnancy, you know, they won't do the booking appointments. They'll just hold off because they don't want to have to deal with, well, the extra scrutiny, I suppose, and um, this thing of proof that you're going to be a parent nine months down the line, proof that you're going to be able to parent a teenager, which non-disabled people are never subjected to. Um, and also, I suppose, the fact that there is so little knowledge among professionals as well. It's sort of once a disability is entered into the, the picture, it's like, oh, well, well, we'll pass you over to a disability service. But equally, in the disability service sector, there isn't the parenting expertise or the, the maternity. And um, so people are really caught in between these two, um, these two, I suppose, rocks and finding support that is right for them is extremely difficult. Um, we've heard that where peer support has been made available, it's extremely informal and very difficult to get, but so effective. Um, and that was one of the bonuses of the discussion for as well, of people saying, oh, do you know, I'm a bit further down the parenting line or the pregnancy line. Here's what worked well for me. Let's see if it can work for you. Um, so yeah, those sorts of, they're the, the, the big findings, I suppose, ableism, the fact that laws and policies can be on their face ableist as well. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's sort of the, the, the main theme that goes through all of the issues. The, the, the abortion or the health act the termination of pregnancy act we know that it allows that it, it looks very neutral on the face of it um, allowing for abortion without reason up to 12 weeks but if you're a disabled person depending on what your health conditions are it can be very difficult to identify pregnancy within 12 weeks and then trying to uh, locate a GP who provides service and um, if you are reliant on family members or support people who object or are opposed to abortion um, that they might deliberately not support you to find those supports. Um, the fact that you have to go to the My Options helpline and we've had really good engagement with staff for My Options and they've been really open. But that um, a GP's information can only be given out over the phone rather than by text or over the web chat. That can be very difficult if you're relying on someone else to make the phone call for you. For example, if you're deaf or hard of hearing or English isn't your first language. Um, so finding out information about who can provide the abortion can be difficult. The time frame makes it much more difficult. Getting yourself to a service if you have to travel outside of your own county. And I'm sure we all know that there are black spots in the country where you do physically have to leave. If you're reliant on public transport, is that going to be accessible to you? And then also disabled people are already parents as well. We know most people who are receiving abortions are parents. So, or they might have other caring duties towards family members or work. And um, so juggling all of these things, um, it was sort of put to us quite um, amusingly by um, people who would support abortion services and um, that it's sort of like, 
oh, is it Fred and Ginger, whatever Fred did, Ginger has to do backwards and in heels. Um, so it's like take all the, the difficulties with accessing abortion in Ireland and just multiply it. Um, because if you're disabled, you have so many more um, barriers. So we definitely be hoping that if there are reviews coming up off the law, that the 12 weeks will be looked at really carefully and just see how difficult it is for certain um, sections of society. in terms of resourcing um, a lot of people consider disability and reasonable accommodations to be an add-on but if you take a step backwards and most health services are subject to the uh, public sector duty around human rights and equality so you, you are obliged to from the kind of the planning stages of services to consider what are the human rights and equality impacts of how we deliver our services to the people who use them or the people working within them um, so by not considering disability as an add-on, but embedding it from the start, um, it will be so much, it, everyone in the community will be able to use a service that is disability friendly. We have to recognise that people can acquire disability. Um, you know, you may already have had children, but still be in your reproductive years, have acquired a disability, and now you're looking at a very different, you know, you're using the same services, but from a very different standpoint. Um, and everyone should be entitled, regardless of what their situation is, to the same quality, um, high quality standard maternity and parental supports. Um, so I think having like the resources argument is usually most often made against things being disability friendly, um, but it's going to be much more financially viable from the, the get go if you can kind of include disability friendly policies and practices from the start. So that's kind of the a third part of our project is to develop toolkits for professionals. So we're literally writing sort of do's and don'ts across each of our topics. And we're finding ourselves, it can be really simple things and everybody has a responsibility for accessibility. Um, I know many organizations have a disability officer, but we shouldn't be relying on one person having all that knowledge. Everyone has a duty to inform themselves of how accessible where they work is. And it can be just, if you pick up the phone, you're taking an appointment, alert people you know there's a ramp around the side and just do that as the norm um, because you might not know whether the person is a wheelchair user or they might be at a different stage of mobility and they might have different assistive devices they may have a buggy with them on the day and that's going to benefit them as well um, so knowing where the accessible bathrooms are and um, what we heard especially from maternity service staff was you know when we asked do you know is there accessible bathrooms they said well yes for the women but not necessarily for the partners. And sure, partners, of course, could have different um, mobility and accessibility needs. Um, and they're a very important part of someone's pregnancy journey. Um, having clear information on websites, um, having information available in easy to read in different languages, um, knowing how to go about booking a sign language interpreter, that seems to be a big problem. You know, people have sort of said, it just, God, I wouldn't know what to do, or where would I start? So informing yourself and not having the individual who's coming to you as a patient or a service user, like we, we've been seeing, there's a lot of labor put on the individual um, to make sure their needs are met, which isn't put on non-disabled people, and which couldn't be expected. I mean, you're already coming to a health service, there's a huge power imbalance. And um, so for you to have to know, you know, to have to figure out where in the hospital can I go for a bathroom or is the cafe accessible or how do I get in the front door? Um, who can I talk to once I get in there? Um, is there sort of a quiet room, um, particularly if you're on the autism spectrum disorder, can there be really kind of small um, accommodations made if you, again, depending on your access needs, can appointments be kept for early morning or the evening when times might be quieter, that it might be more suitable for people with different needs to use. Um, and yeah, again, if you come across someone, um, you know that their access needs haven't been met, don't just sit on it, you know, find out who in your organisation needs to know to make it, um, to improve the situation. Um, and to make sure, you know, you do have a duty if you're making an appointment or you're organising services, if you're referring on, is the service that you're referring to, do they have accessibility, um, kind of know-how and is the person going to be able to use them? It was just as you mentioned around sort of 
interpretation and communication, not to be relying, you know, someone might go in with a child or a family member. I don't want my sister necessarily knowing about what my fertility needs are. So don't be relying on the informal, you know, I have a right to sign language interpretation or language interpretation. It's not always appropriate that a child or a family member um, or even sometimes, you know, a disability support person if they don't have to know, they don't have to know. Uh, and unless the individual explicitly, you know, requests them be present and to provide that support, don't assume that it's going to be done by them because that can be very, and one of our oral histories did, um, it was a woman who's a sign language user um, from when she was much younger, had the story about going, feeling unwell having not told her parents that she was on the contraceptive pill and then realizing i'm going to have to disclose this now and it's you know just not ideal because she didn't know how her mother was going to react and that's not what she should have been worrying about in that time it should have been her health and she shouldn't have been afraid to disclose anything Um, so we know that the abortion legislation, I know I've already touched on that, that where it, it can be amended and if there can be advocacy done um, to really consider while something looks neutral on the face of it, how is this being received on the ground? And we hope that the real project is, you know, providing that data and that evidence. Um, we know around assisted human reproduction, it's a space that's totally unregulated, but can be really important for disabled people. Um, and where we have seen proposed legislation, it does seem on the face of it to be quite ableist and discriminatory. It would give providers a lot of leeway in deciding themselves whether to provide a service or not to a disabled uh, potential parent. Um, so there's a lot of sort of ableism and, and value laden decisions being made there about quality of life and um, those sorts of things. Um, again, like I said, integrating disability friendly practices throughout the health service. So from training, um, if there can be continuous professional development as well, that is open um, to kind of increasing awareness about disability issues and to seek disability information from disabled people themselves and um, maybe rather than service providers and um, so disabled people's organizations groups that are run by disabled people for disabled people they're going to have the most relevant most unbiased knowledge um, and they're always very keen to reach out and to promote kind of anything they can and um, they're happy to work with that. We're in the process of developing our toolkits, so we've been engaging with professionals and people with lived experiences about what we're including, how relevant it is, and we're really hoping that it's going to be a, like a, a really useful tool for professionals on any of our themes, so fertility and contraception, pregnancy and birth, abortion and parenting, um, so that you'd be able to use this toolkit to see some do's and don'ts absolutely for everything from how you start to take the appointment to delivering the service to follow up how you might be able to engage with your colleagues and increase awareness there um, and also to give like really insightful uh, quotes from people that we've heard from who've been recipients of health services and um, so yeah we're hoping that the the tools will be used far and wide um, once we get them kind of in the in the first quarter of next year we're hoping they'll be made available